and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany. I am a nurse practitioner. If you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. I am so very happy to have you here. Much of the content that I create here on my channel is educational, not only for that licensed nurse practitioner, but also for our nurse practitioner students. As you may know, I have completed multiple different nurse practitioner boards reviews in the past, and I'm just finding new ways to deliver you the content that you need to pass your board's exam and at the most affordable price available. So I've taken to my review one more time. I've revamped it again. This time I'm delivering it a little bit differently. I'm using my YouTube platform here and I've created a Patreon. For today's lecture, I'm gonna be talking all about the cardiovascular system for the AANP and the ANCC. This is a huge, huge topic on your board's exam. So important, there's so much material to cover. This video here is going to be a shortened version. To get access to this complete video and the complete audio files for the review for the nurse practitioner licensing exam, then follow the link in the description below and that will take you to my Patreon. The total review course, it will launch on February 27th, 2023, in which case you would pay for a monthly access. Please, of course, enjoy this free video, which can absolutely help you to study. And then if you want to access the complete audio files, then make sure you become a Patreon and you should join the tier titled ANCC and AANP exam prep course. Again, that complete course does not launch until February 27th. I just want to make sure to give you guys a lot of sneak peeks of what's to come and a little bit of a buildup before I'm able to launch the entire course. All right, so without further delay, let's dive into the cardiovascular system. Okay, so let's talk about hypertension. So the treatment of hypertension is the most common reason for chronic prescription medications, of which approximately 50% of those are estimated to not have adequate control of their blood pressure. So this is huge. And you better believe this is definitely a hot topic for your board's exam. So you wanna be familiar with how to diagnose and how to treat hypertension. So first we will review the guidelines provided by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology in 2017. They put out parameters defining what a normal blood pressure is and what is considered elevated and what is defined as hypertension. So a normal blood pressure, it's defined as a systolic less than 120 and a diastolic less than 80. A systolic of 120 to 129, however, a diastolic that remains less than 80 is considered an elevated reading, but it's not classified as hypertension. And once we start climbing numbers higher than this is when we begin to classify hypertension. Hypertension stage one, this is a systolic between 130 and 139 and a diastolic of 80 to 89. Hypertension stage two is a systolic at least 140 or a diastolic at least 90. So a diagnosis of hypertension should be confirmed using out of office blood pressure measurements whenever this is possible. This is also referred to as home or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. You may also see the mnemonic ABPM, which stands for ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. This is considered gold standard when diagnosing hypertension. So if the patient has one or more of the following criteria using that ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, then this indicates a diagnosis for hypertension. So there's three criteria here. One, criteria include a 24-hour mean of either a systolic of 125 or greater or a diastolic of 75 or greater. Two, daytime or awake time mean of either a systolic of 130 or greater or a diastolic of 80 or greater. And then finally three, nighttime or a sleep time mean of either a systolic of 110 or greater or a diastolic of 65 or greater. When you're instructing patients to go home and monitor their blood pressure, it's important that you confirm they have access to a validated automated device. It, this needs to calculate a person's blood pressure using their brachial artery. So it's really important you make sure they have a good device to use. And it's, you should instruct them then to take their blood pressure when at home 
in a quiet room after five minutes of rest, most comfortable position possible, arms down at their side, legs uncrossed, back straight, the most ideal situation. And once they are in that calm, no pain, no stress moment, they should take their blood pressure. Between 12 and 14 blood pressures should be taken, and this should include both morning and evening measurements. And this is recommended to do, to do this over a period of about one week each month. Only circumstances where there are no out of office confirmatory readings are required in the following. These are much less common, but there are a couple circumstances that you don't need to do this ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And so it's really important to be familiar with these. One, if a patient presents with a hypertensive urgency or emergency. So the numbers with this is a systolic of 180 or greater or a diastolic of 120 or greater. Of course, you wanna confirm the reading, you wanna repeat it on the other arm and you want to make sure that you're getting an accurate reading, but that, is a, that one does not require out of office confirmatory readings if that's an accurate blood pressure. Two, a patient who presents with a systolic of 160 or greater or a diastolic of 100 or greater that also have end organ damage. Uh, examples of hypertension related target organ damage include ischemic heart disease, heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, hypertensive retinopathy, chronic kidney disease. So these are the things that you'd be evaluating for. And in the setting with the blood pressure that high, and if those are present, then that also does not require out of office confirmatory readings. So let's get into treatment of hypertension. So of course, non-pharmacological treatment is always mainstay. This absolutely is a very important education point with your patients. So talking about dietary salt restriction, weight loss if that's indicated, exercise, limiting alcohol intake, lots of different life choices that they can make to have better control of their hypertension. There is the DASH diet, that's a mnemonic for dietary approach to stop hypertension. So that's a diet that's high in vegetables and fruits, low fat dairy, whole grains, poultry, fish, nuts, again, low in salt. Pharmacological therapy, this is generally indicated in patients that are classified as having hypertension. However, with some populations, you can definitely have a little bit of a less aggressive goal with blood pressure management. So some of the guidelines say you could have a little bit of a less stringent, so a systolic less than 135 or a diastolic and less than, that's less than 85. If the person has, for example, history of postural hypotension, so they really have a tendency for their blood pressure to drop, you might be a little bit more lax on your goal. Patients that are 75 or older and they have additional comorbidities, you might be a little bit more lax on your goal. Also, if patients ha are having a lot of side effects or they're using multiple agents and there's a lot of drug interactions, you can, of course, always use your clinical reasoning to make sure that each time you're treating a patient with hypertension, you're kind of tailoring it to them and their risk factors and their comorbidities. So generally, we do follow those guidelines that we just went over with the systolic and the diastolic, but in those patients that are a little bit more at risk for going really low blood pressure, if they're elderly with lots of comorbidities, you can have a little bit more of that lax goal. So if you are gonna be using pharmacotherapy for the treatment of hypertension, there are multiple first-line agents available. So there's the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or the ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin II receptor blockers or ARBs, calcium channel blockers, and thiazide diuretics. All of those are considered first-line. Also beta blockers and alpha blockers, but those are not first-line agents for hypertension. They do, they do have a purpose though, and we'll talk about those a little bit, but the main first-line agents are what we're gonna focus on. So an important point with managing hypertension is that a single antihypertensive agent is unlikely to be successful if a person's blood pressure is more than 20 over 10 above goal. So that's really important to be aware of going in. If they are more than 20 over 10 above goal, they are likely going to need an additional agent. And so if you look at the data, it says increasing a hypertension agent dose 
should only be done one time before adding on a second agent. And this is because every time that you increase and titrate the dose up, you also increase the likelihood of them having negative side effects. So if it's not properly controlled with that initial dose, you can titrate up one time. If that's still not effective, do not titrate it up anymore. Instead, you will add on a second agent. And so let's go over the meds now. All right, so first up, let's talk about ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So both of these agents, they are used in the treatment of hypertension with patients that also have chronic kidney disease and heart failure. These are great drug classes for those patients. Specifically those populations, I should say, they're definitely used first line for all populations, but those high risk patients really benefit from these drugs. So side effects of ACE inhibitors are related to either decreased angiotensin II or increased kinins. So side effects related to the decreased angiotensin II would be hypotension, acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, and then pregnancy complications. If a patient experiences hyperkalemia and it's unable to be managed, or if their creatinine increases over 30% of their baseline within those first six to eight weeks, then that ACE inhibitor should be stopped and it should be obviously considered if they should go back on it or if they should switch agents. Uh, side effects that are relate, related to the increased kinins would be that dry hacking cough that we sometimes hear uh, patients experience with the ACE inhibitor. It is rare, but also uh, angioedema is a risk with the increased kinins. And so that is definitely something we wanna have on our radar. So it's really important that you're familiar with the contraindications in these uh, with patients in these drugs. So if they're pregnant, they cannot take an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, absolutely not. If you're managing hypertension in pregnant patients, and we'll go over this a little bit more, but um, labetalol, and that's the one time that you'll really see like a beta blocker is a first line agent with hypertension. Labetalol is first for pregnant women that have hypertension. Another option would be methylodopa and nifedipine. Those are also, but typically you'll see labetalol. Uh, ACE inhibitors are also contraindicated in patients that have a history of angioedema because we know there is a little bit of an increased risk if they have a history of it. We definitely want to avoid this drug class in this patient. Also, if they are concurrently taking an ARB. So another important thing that you need to know is that ACE inhibitors and ARBs, those angiotensin receptor blockers, cannot be used together. Great agents cannot be used together. They have an increased risk for adverse events, potentially linked to increase in cancers as well. So we definitely don't wanna be combining those. So for ACE inhibitors, all of those agents end in PRIL, P-R-I-L. So some examples would be like lisinopril, captopril, those are definitely very common. ARBs have a very similar drug pro profile to ACE inhibitors. They are less likely, however, to cause that dry hacking cough that we can see with ACE inhibitors. So if they experience that cough with using an ACE, you can try switching them to an ARB. Um, so all of these drugs, they end in Sartan, S-A-R-T-A-N. So for example, Losartan, Velsartan, those are really commonly used uh, for those ARBs as well. Both very great uh, drug classes, definitely again for those patients that have chronic kidney disease, heart failure, just remember we don't use them together, we don't use them in pregnant people, definitely some important points. All right, so next up, let's talk about calcium channel blockers. So calcium channel blockers, these can be used as monotherapy or they can be used as an adjunct to another antihypertensive agent. There has been a ton of data that has shown a reduction in subsequent cardiac events in patients that are treated with calcium channel blockers. And so therefore, definitely another great drug class and a widely used drug class. It is very important to note that calcium channel blockers are metabolized through that cytochrome P450 system. The dihydropyridines less so, and we'll talk about how those are divided. It is something to take note of. So they should be cautious if they're taking other agents that are metabolized through this pathway or if they're combining it with grapefruit juice. Definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, examples of other agents that work on that same cytochrome P450 system, so statins, azoles, definitely something that you wanna be looking out for on their list of drugs. So like I said, this, is, this class is divided into two groups, the dihydropyridines and then the non 
dihydropyridines. So examples of non-dihydropyridines would be verapamil and diltiazem. The non-dihydropyridines, these are a weaker vasodilator. They work more to decrease contractility of the heart. They are used for hypertension, just less frequently. They're also used for chronic stable angina, cardiac arrhythmias, and they're also used to reduce protein in the urine. So an easy way to keep these up uh, remembered is that non-dihydropyridines are not preferred for hypertension. The non-dihydropyridines are not preferred for hypertension. They can be used again, but they're not as effective. Side effects of the non-dihydropyridines would be bradycardia, decreased cardiac output. It is relatively contraindicated in patients that are also on beta blockers or patients that have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, patients with sick sinus syndrome, or if they have a second or third degree heart block. Also, chronic use of calcium channel blockers has been associated with gingival hyperplasia. So the dihydropyridines, however, are potent vasodilators. So those non-dihydropyridines really work more on the heart. The dihydropyridines, these are very potent vasodilators, minimal cardiac effects, and so they are definitely the preferred uh, treatment option for hypertension. Also, they're used for chronic stable angina as well. So as you can see, the, di the dihydropyridines, those all end in pene, P-I-N-E, so amlodipine, nifedipine, nicardipine are all examples. Potential side effects of this, the dihydropyridines, would be headache, lightheadedness, flushing, dependent peripheral edema, and like I said, gingival hyperplasia can occur with chronic use of all classes of those calcium channel blockers. Peripheral edema, so this is seen in up to 30% of patients being treated with calcium channel blockers. And so the literature says, instead of adding on a diuretic to try and correct that peripheral edema, try a combination of reducing the dose of the calcium channel blocker and then adding on an ACE or an ARB. Or you could try switching it to a non-dihydropyridine. 